praise God. We're going to be in the ESV version of the Bible this morning, or ESV translation. We're going to be in John chapter uh, 6, and I'm going to read a passage of Scripture to you out of John chapter 6, starting in verse uh, 27, and we're going to read through verse 36. Uh, a couple weeks back, I think it was three weeks ago, I was allowed to preach back then. And uh, I started, I'm calling it a series, it's probably going to be one more time. Um, the Lord just put it on my heart to preach about the bread of life, amen? And to speak about uh, speak about His life that He has come to give us, praise God. So here we go, John chapter 6, starting in verse, uh, let's just go ahead and go up to verse 26 if you, if you don't mind. Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, you are seeking me not because you saw signs, but because you ate your filth of the loaves. Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you, for on him God the Father has set his seal. Then they said to him, what must we do to be doing the works of God? Oh, I forgot something. We're supposed to stand up when we read the word of God. Forgive me, guys. I apologize for that. Thank you, Lord. So let's start over. Just love me. Verse 26. Love me, sister. Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, verse 26, You are seeking me not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you, for on him God the Father has set his seal. Then they said to him, What must we do to be doing the works of God? Jesus answered them, This is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. So they said to him, then what sign do you do that we may see and believe you? What work do you perform? Our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus then said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but my father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. They said to him, Sir, give us this bread always. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me, and yet do not believe. Father, we just thank you this morning for your precious son, Lord, and for your holy word that reveals him to us, for he is the, the living word of God. And we thank you, Lord God, for the word that you've given us that reveals his heart, Lord, and we desire this morning, Lord, I know that I do, Lord, that you would reveal Jesus to us from the scripture this morning, that you would allow Jesus to enter into our hearts and that he would transform our very lives, O oh Lord. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would use me this morning as an oracle, just a simple mouthpiece that would speak forth your truth. I pray that my personality would not get in your way. I pray, O oh Lord God, that Matt Abraham would not get in your way, but that Jesus would be magnified and glorified, that the truth would be told, and that the Holy Spirit would witness it in the hearts and lives of his people, O oh Lord God. Have your way this morning in this service. We just give you glory. Glory and honor in Jesus name we pray. Amen. Praise God. <laughs> Thank you for your patience with me. Amen. Thank you, Lord. So before I get started the other night, I, was, I didn't know if I was supposed to do this, but the, I felt like the Lord kind of mentioned it to me or showed me again to go ahead and do it. There may be one person in this place this morning that might know who I'm talking about. Other than that, I pretty much feel like the person is going to remain anonymous. But maybe not. But uh, anyway, uh, so this is the, this is the, what happened. About five, six years ago, I guess, when I was really into the whole fitness thing, I was in the gym and I was working out. And I would oftentimes would have opportunities to speak to people about Jesus, right? And so there was this guy in there who was really like, you know, he was chiseled, I guess you would say. And I would try to find out 
information from people because obviously if somebody looks like that, then they know a little bit about what they're doing. So I would talk to them, but I'm always like looking for an opportunity to springboard into Jesus, right? And so I start talking to this guy about Jesus, man, and I'm just giving him some scripture, and I'm not really knowing how to read the guy, you know, but I felt the Holy Spirit flowing, and I'm kind of hitting this and that. Well, it was a couple days later that he's in there again, and so um, you know, I started to do the same thing. I started talking about Jesus, and then all of a sudden, I started to quote a scripture, and he finished it. And I was like, oh, well, what's all this about? He's like, I was a pastor, man. I'm like, what? He's like, yeah, I was a pastor. And I was talking about the seeker sensitive movement in the church, too. I used to, I used to talk more about that than I did about Jesus. Lord. <laughs> but it is a problem. And I was talking about, man, we're going to change the message of Jesus. We don't want to offend anyone anymore. We don't want to tell the truth. We're concerned that people aren't going to come back to hear about the real Christ, to hear about his sacrifice. And so I was saying all of this stuff. And then on the second day when I said this scripture and he finished it, I said, and then he says, I was a pastor. And I'm like, what kind of church did you pastor? He said, a seeker sensitive church. <laughs> and I was like, oh. Okay, I said, well, well, what happened? He said, the Lord told me I was going to go to hell. Wow. So he tells me this story about how he went to this church growth conference. And in the midst of this church growth conference, he learned some techniques and some different things having to do with metrics and different things that you could do. Just kind of like how you build a business in America, capitalism and free enterprise. And, you know, pastors are now CEOs and we kind of put on like a, uh, you got this formula and man, it's just like the people flock to it. Now, listen to me. If the Holy Spirit's added to the church and that's what I'm praying, Lord, won't you move by the power and the anointing of your Holy Spirit? Won't you heal the sick? Won't you deliver those that, 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 that need deliverance? Amen. Won't you move and won't you add to the church? That's the book of Acts. And praise God if that's church growth. Because look, every big church out there doesn't mean it's a mega church with the wrong mindset. Amen. <laughs> so he went to this church growth conference and they were telling him all these little things that you had to do. And he said, I thought to myself, I can do that. And he said, the next thing you know, I'm a pastor of a church in Dallas of nearly 2,000 people. And he said, man, I'm telling you what. He said, look, everything that I needed, I had it. We'd go eat. I had, I had the nicest of cars. I was living in the nicest of houses. Me and my wife would walk into the restaurants. People were picking up our bill. Everybody loved me. And then he said, the Lord showed me you're going to hell. Wow. If you keep preaching this, you're going to hell. And I'm not even saying God served the Lord. I'm just telling him, man, don't. He said, if you can, and, he, and he, said, he said, I said, so you just left? He's like, I just left. Wow. He said they didn't even know I was leaving, but my last message, and that's what made me think of it because of it was out of this chapter. He, he, he preached to the crowd. He said this, take this back to the kitchen because I, it's not good for me. Wow. And he preached on John chapter 6, and he said, today is the last day that I'll be acting as your pastor. And he left and he moved on. I wanted to share that. I believe the Lord wants us to understand that, that in the, listen, it's not going to get better. You understand what I'm trying to say? There's, that, listen, no, it is going to get better. Hallelujah. Because Jesus is coming back. Amen. And he's going to rule and reign. And in the millennial reign of Christ, there's going to be a flip-flop, my friend. The spirit of Antichrist will no longer be the prince of the power of the air, working in the children of disobedience. There's going to be a flip-flop and the spirit of the Christ is going to usher in the messianic age. Amen. And the wolf and the lamb will lie together and the lion will eat straw like an ox and the child will put their hand on the viper's hole. Praise God. And everyone will have the knowledge of the Lord. But until that day, it ain't getting better. And the enemy is moving. But listen, this is the thing. Daniel said this. In the midst of all of that, the people that know their God are going to do great exploits. And my only desire for you this morning and anybody that might watch our video is that we would all learn to come to the truth of knowing our Lord. And there's words that he speaks in this chapter that I'm like, Lord, what are you saying? Like, as a pastor or a preacher of your gospel, and I know you called me, but I got to know you. Listen, y'all heard my story before how I was in that barroom bathroom, how I was running. I hadn't been in a barroom in 12 years. And praise God, that night the Holy Spirit showed up in that place. And he said, it was a long story, but he said, you will present my word for the way that it's written. And then I will use you. And listen, I, for a long time, I thought I knew what that meant. 
And even recently, like over the last month, month and a half, he's been speaking to me. And he's like, son, you constantly have to be learning. You constantly have to be dying so that you can stay humble so I can speak to you. Because what you think you know, come on. He said, no, don't throw away what you've learned. But what you thought you knew, you didn't, you, you're just scratching the surface. Not only is it more theology to learn, not, and when I say theology and doctrine, listen, I'm talking about Jesus. That's what theology means, the study of God. That's what doctrine is. He, the Apostle Paul said in the letter to the Roman church, thank God that you received that doctrine you were given, the doctrine of Christ crucified, the truth of how we can be reconciled back to God through his blood. Amen, but this is what he'd been telling me. But you got to present it from his heart. You got to have a heart of love for his bride, for his church, for his body, because they belong to him. And he loved her. And he laid his life down for her. And he's proven his love. And so I've got you to need you to understand something this morning, church. You, if you're converted this morning, if you have truly received Christ as your Lord and Savior, if you haven't, you need to. Amen. If you haven't received Jesus, you need to receive Jesus, my friend. Because right. we're all going to cross that river one day. And we're going to stand before him. And we're going to give an account. And listen to me. We're on a journey. We're on a journey towards judgment. The area, we forget the fact that God's a judge. We're on a journey towards judgment. The good news is this. Is that God has already poured his wrath out on his son. Yes. And when we stand and, and we face the Lord... Amen. I pray for you. I pray for me. Well, I, praise God. I pray for us that that whenever we get there, that we will have said yes to the fact that the God, that God the Father so loved the world that He poured His wrath upon His Son, and see your judgment has been placed on His Son, and so therefore that means that if you've believed this morning, you've been covered in the righteousness of Jesus. We talked about that in Romans five last week. Amen. He said five times in the book of Romans chapter five, the word "gift" is used, and finally the big reveal in chapter verse seventeen: that righteousness has a name. His name is Jesus. Righteousness is a gift. Hallelujah! And it's been given to you as a gift based on faith. Faith in Him and what He did. And so if you've received Christ by faith this morning, praise God. The wrath of His Son, the wrath was poured out on His Son, and you don't have to face the wrath of God. That's a beautiful point. Amen. Amen. And, and so that's what, we're, that's what I desire to know is this Jesus. Amen. That I've been praying that. I've been praying, Father, you got to put His heart in me. You got to put you got to put the heart of your son in me, and you know one of the things that he's showing me. And listen, I, I encourage you to pray a prayer like that. But when you do, go ahead and just buckle your seatbelt up, buddy, because the Lord will remind you, you. Are you serious? You sure you want that? Because do you remember what they did to him? And listen, this is not what is me time. I'm just being real with you. You will, you are in the midst of a spiritual battle. The good news is this: is that the Jesus that you serve has won the victory. You're more than a conqueror through Christ who loves you and gave himself for you. And there's no devil in hell that has power and authority over you. You're a son of the living God and all power, all dominion, all authority that was lost in Adam has been regained in the eternal son. Hallelujah. And we can walk in that. We can believe that. I'm here to tell you he wants to equip you. Come on, saints of God. He wants to equip you to get you to the point where you're not just, you don't just only sit in the pew to come hear the word of the living God, but you're sharing the word of the living God with those that are lost and are dying out there. Amen. Not just in the prison house, but praise God at the workplace. Not just at the workplace, but in Walmart. Wherever the Lord would lead you. Wherever He would take you to share the good news of Jesus to this lost and dying world. Amen. Amen. But I'm going to be honest with you. We need to know Him before we get into all that. Lord, help us to know Your Son. Amen. Last week, uh, last time I preached, we talked there was a couple of things I wanted to remind you about. Jesus said this. So whenever we're going into John chapter 6, we have to understand this. Jesus already, this was already said about him at the end of chapter 2. And I'm just paraphrasing. Jesus did not entrust himself to them because he knew all people. He did not need anyone to tell him about man because he knew what was in man. You know, it's an amazing thing. To have the Holy Spirit help us to understand. You know, you can't trust every. You know what it says in, in Matthew chapter 24? That in the last days, brother will betray brother. Sister will betray sister. People are going to become offended. 
The scripture teaches, listen, I understand we might have differing eschatology, that's a fancy word for end time. We might have different timing for the rapture event. I understand that. Okay? But, but what I want you to know is this, is that as the days grow dark, the scripture says in the last days that some people's sons and daughters will be trained. The scripture teaches that those that are closest to you, there's, the scripture says that there's going to be, in the last days, there's going to be perilous times. The newer translations use the word difficult. No, perilous. Perilous times that were not seen on the earth before. I'm not here to be some kind of scare tactic to try to scare. I'm trying to get our head right to understand that you and I as true believers in Christ, what we're dealing with, what we're in the midst of, and to understand something that, that look, Paul and Peter were in the midst of the mighty Roman Empire, and, and, they, and, and the Roman Empire was hostile towards the people of God, and even in the midst of all of that, the grace of God, the power of God, the signs and wonders of God were following them and he was equipping them and empowering them to do the work of the kingdom and I just believe with all of my heart that it's going to be even more so at the end Amen. that while it's going to be perilous times I believe with all of my heart for those that are willing to die to self and to allow Christ to have his way in them he will use them in the midst of that Amen. I believe that there's going to be a line drawn in the sand, my friend. Just like it was with Moses. So anyway, he did not entrust himself because he knew what was in the heart of man. And I just... But at the same time, he loved. Because see, in the Matthew version of John 6, it says that he saw the crowd and he had compassion on them. He had compassion on them. And he began to... He saw them as sheep without a shepherd. He began to teach them. And that's the compassion that the Lord has for you and I. This morning, I believe that he wants... His sheep, he says, my sheep know my voice and, 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 and I've heard of them. Amen. And, and that in order for us to know his voice, we have to know him. And in order to know him, we have to know his word. A while back, I preached to Jesus said, no man has seen the father, only the son that was in the bosom of the father. I'm not going to get weird and go nest on my head in anybody's chest right now. But that's the idea to be in the bosom. It's like a, it's like a mother with her child in her bosom. It's a place of closeness and intimacy. And then John's teaching us this in his very letter. He said, I'm the one. He didn't say who he was, but he said, the beloved who had who was in the bosom of the son. And so John in his gospel is trying to teach you and I something that if we, have, if we have a yearning to know the father, that the only way we'll ever know the father is that we know the son. That we would be intimate with him because he reveals he's the physical, the visible representation of the invisible God. Amen. And the more that Jesus is formed and fashioned in us, amen, the more we begin to look like him. That's really been prevalent on the heart. I know I keep saying that, but I don't think we can say it enough. Form and fashion me into the image of your son. I think I said it the last, recently, whenever I said, you know, whenever the father's in heaven and he looks to his right, what does he see? He sees his son. He sees that he bears the wounds in his body. The scripture teaches us at the end of Revelation that he still he bears the wounds in his body because they call him the lamb. He, he, and I understand. He said, I turned to see a lamb that was as though it had been slain. I saw a lion <laughs> because there's a roar in the lamb. Come on. There's great power in the lamb of God. But in the last chapters of Revelation, he's called the lamb of God. He, he bears the wounds in his body. And whenever the Father, there's something so powerful to that for you and your understanding of Christ. I believe this. That when the Father sees, looks to his right and he sees his son, intercession is already there. I'm not saying that Jesus isn't up there praying for us, but he ever lived to make intercession. Intercession literally means to be a go-between, a mediator. And it's because of his wounded body that there is a go-between. It's because of his wounded body that there is a split to the veil. It's because of his wounded body that we have entry, entree, and intimacy with the, the Father because of that. Amen. Amen. It's the Father's will that he look upon the earth and see his son. Yes. And the only way that he'll be able to look upon the earth and see his son is if his son is being formed and fashioned in you. Amen. Mm. If his son is being formed and fashioned in me. And this is much of what my message is about this morning. But I got to tell you that if he's looking at his son and he sees 
what brought him there by his side it's only that same thing that's going to allow him to see his son in you when he looks upon you what are you talking about preacher Romans chapter 2 talks about the circumcision of the heart yes. later on it talks about the circumcision not done with the hands of man Peter yes. talked about it but that by the spirit of God a whittling away, a chiseling away at Matt Abair so that Jesus, so that the Jesus seed, come on somebody, yeah. that the Jesus seed, the incorruptible seed, come on, would begin to grow in Matt to the Amen. point where the, the faith, to, to the point where the glory of God, Jesus said this in John 17, he said, the glory you gave me, I have given it unto them. Jesus, if you are pregnant with Jesus this morning, I'm here to tell you, you got good news. Jesus lives in you. If you're born again this morning, that means that Jesus is in you. The scripture teaches that your spirit has become one with his spirit in 1 Corinthians 6 and 17. You're already born again. You're never going to be more born again than what you're born again right now. But there can be a lot more chiseling to be done. Yes. A lot more circumcising to be amen. done. Come on, church. Help me out here. Amen. Uh, amen. I'm preaching better than, than, than your amen. And praise God. And you don't have to amen. It's okay. No, really. It's, no, that's not what's important. What's important is that we get it. Amen. We get Christ. All right. So, so my Jesus knew what was in their heart, yet he still had compassion on them. He knew what they were going to do to them, to him. I cannot emphasize this enough. When he rode into Jerusalem on a donkey and they threw the palm branches on, none of this is in my notes, but this is the story. They threw the palm branches and they Hosanna in the highest. Oh, blessed be the king, recognizing him as the son of David. And the whole time you're going to tell me that the Lord with his, you know, they call it the prophetic feeler now. But with his prophetic feeling, because he said it to Simon the Pharisee. Simon didn't even say it. <laughs> he said, Simon, this woman didn't quit kissing my feet. She's washing my feet with her tears. And you, because Simon was like, he knew what kind of woman she was. And the whole time, you're going to tell me that that spirit, that gift of the spirit operating in Jesus that called people out for what they're thinking, didn't know, look at this crowd right here. Yeah. Next week, they're going to have my life. Next week, they're going to call for me to be crucified. Mm -hmm. And yet, he still loved them. Mm -hmm. That's the kind of Jesus we've got to get a hold of, church. Because, see, if we're going to get a hold of that Jesus, you're going to get less offended by me. I'm going to get less offended Amen. by you. Praise God. I don't want to offend anybody, but I can promise you it's going to happen at some point in time. And I mean that. You, you understand? But he got a but we still have to yield to the crucifying of our flesh. Yes. Amen? All right, you get that point. So, so... He knew what was in their heart. And look, they came all that way. You know, in the beginning of the story, they came all that way to, to see this man because he had fed them and they were drawn to him. I, I don't think that I'm improperly presenting the story. Work with me here. They, he had fed them and because of that, they were drawn to him after what he had done for them. Yeah. Right? He definitely wasn't interested in furthering their agenda or thoughts or regarding what his purpose was. You understand what I'm trying to say? I remember the story. They're like, and I mean, sometimes I get a little dramatic and I don't mean to overdo it, but it's like they're coming up to him like, Rabbi, when would you get here? It's kind of like when Nicodemus came to him and said, Rabbi, surely you're from God. Look at all the things you're doing. Verily, verily, Nicodemus, I say unto you, unless a man is born again, he will not enter the kingdom of God and he will not enter the kingdom. Rabbi, when did you get here? Jesus is like, you seek me not because you saw the miracle. Mm. Or you seek me not because you saw the sign, but instead because your bellies were filled. I mean, that, that's kind of harsh. Yes. No? I mean, it would be considered harsh in some services today. But no, it's not harsh. It's just the truth. <laughs> He's just telling the truth. But sometimes we can't even handle that, right? It's just like, no, let's cut through the chase. Let's get to the nitty gritty. Because you know why? Because we're talking about eternal souls here. That's right. God is either real. The plan is either real. Jesus is either real. And he had to hang naked on the cross in order for the new covenant to come to pass. And it's either true that in him is life eternal or outside of him is, is condemnation and guilt. Yeah. And if it's true, then we really want to be able to speak freely and like Jesus said, he that has ears to hear, let him hear. Yeah. 
Amen. If you don't have ears, you're still allowed to hear. Praise God. And I'll pray that the Lord, would you pray for me a special prayer? Would you pray that, that Pastor Matt would not wield a sword like Peter and cut people's ears off? There ain't no sense in cutting nobody's ears off. Amen. But let the word of the Lord go forth and let the truth be spoken. All right. So they came to him and, and he's not interested in furthering their thoughts. And, you know, I want to say this. This is my opinion that it saddens him because I believe many of his followers still do this today. We seek him for what he can do for us instead of for who he truly is. I don't know that we always try to do that. I don't think we always have that plan. And, and there's a growth, right? There's growth in Christ. I'm learning that not only is there growth as an individual believer, but there's also growth for preachers. Amen. Praise God. Humans tend to be like that, right? If a relationship makes us feel good or do, does something for us, we're in, right? But seldom do we take time to interest ourselves in the other person. Now, I'm not saying everybody's like that, but some people are more so that way. No, that's a good message for husbands in this house. <laughs> not just husbands, but maybe wives too. That, that oftentimes we're, we're so focused on what you can do for me that I'm never focused on what about you? Amen. What about you, honey? Yeah. What, what about what's going on in your life? What about actually getting, you know, there's times that people married for 30 years, sleep in the same bed, don't even know each other. They never even really get to know each other. And, and I feel like in relationships, we do that. And we seldom take time to interest ourselves in other people. And sometimes you can see that whenever you're in conversations with people that are either your friends or people even that go to church. Everything's about them. They never really ask you about you. It's all about them. They're so focused on themselves. Okay. Well, what brings it? So as long as it brings them pleasure, what they hope for in life. You know, and, and so that's the thing, though. Do we think of that in other people's lives? Right? And, and that, but really, I want to transition that thought to Jesus. Because we're very focused on what the Lord can do for us. Lord, would you heal us? Lord, would you touch my finances? Lord, I need a new house. Lord, I need a new car. Amen. Praise God for his provision. He's a blessing God. It's his nature. He blesses. And man, I wish you could have heard some of the testimony. I had this one, the one testimony I gave Robert the guy's party. He's got transition houses in the Ritter. He was a he was a, a homeless on the street for 20 years in New Orleans. He was an IV heroin user for seven years. If you've seen this dude, you would have never believed it. He was incarcerated in that same place. I'm telling you, you wouldn't know, you wouldn't have believed it. There was no vestiges of that story that he told in the in the the appearance of that man. Praise God. None. Amen. Complete restoration. Crazy. Miracle working power Thank of God. Jesus. Hallelujah. Jesus. Praise God. God does these things for us. He is a faithful God. Amen. He's a blessing Amen. God. But what are we going to do? Because you still see it even when you're in the prison. It's like, man, I'm going to get out of this plate. And people are trying to serve God just to get out of prison. And half the time, sometimes maybe that's where we need to be for a period of time. Wherever we are in our life that the Lord has us, we're so hungry to try to get the Lord to get us out of where we are. When the reality of it is, is that the Lord is oftentimes trying to put us there, keep us there, so that he can speak to us in that place. So that he can teach us in the valley how to even operate if we ever make it to the Amen. Praise God. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> and if we'll let him do it while we're in that, oh man, we'll come to know him in a way. But don't ever forget that experience, my friend. Help us. Yes. Keep it in our heart, Lord. Yes, and I feel like we do that, you know, to the Lord. Uh -huh. I feel like that's a big part of the meaning to this text, though, when he says, eat my flesh and drink my blood. We didn't even get to that part, but that's a big part in this chapter when he says that. Remember that. I'll probably preach that next week. And it offended him. He said, you're going to eat my flesh and drink my blood. My flesh is true meat and my blood is true drink. Now he tells us later, he says, it's the words. I want to talk about his words, uh, really, today is what I want to talk about. I mean, he, he said, he, he so it's not literally his flesh, but that that's what I think about even communion, you know? It's feed like let me just say this about when he says, Eat my flesh, drink my blood, it's feeding and being nourished by the real Jesus to the point that we know him intimately because we are being chiseled away and he is growing in us. And I want you to know this that I do believe that in the early church this somewhat 
was something literally whenever they broke bread together in remember, remembrance of the Lord's sacrifice. Not that it was literally his flesh. And I said this earlier, but that supernatural grace literally flowed through their obedience and, and doing what he said. The remembering of his broken body brought them closer in unity to him, closer in unit, closer in unity, and, and, and resulted in a crucifixion of self, which allows the fashioning of Christ in us. Does that make sense? Like in other words, he's he's cru he's crucifying us, he's circumcising us, and the more of us he's getting away, uh, moving away from us, the more Christ is being revealed in us. His, his heart, his love, his compassion, amen, his work, his truth. Amen. Praise God. But, but, but it's not just it's not just communion. Communion is a type of that. You know, the Spirit of God wants to move in our lives. And when we really remember and discern what He has done for us, His death will become our death. His life will become our life. His words, that's really where I want to focus. His words will become our food. And more than anything, I believe that is what we need to talk about this morning. The, the words that are His food, the living word. Peter said this, and you don't have to turn to it, I'm just going to tell you. Since you have been born again, not of perishable, but of imperishable, through the living and abiding word of God. Jesus said, seek not after the food that perishes, but the food that lasts for eternal life. They were like, you filled my belly and it felt so good. What you going to do for me now, Lord? And he's like, seek not the food that perishes, but that which will lead to eternal life. You know, there's something else that I need to stop because the Lord's really been dealing with my heart about this. And the people in the church just don't get tired of me if I've already said it. But let me just say it again. I think we take eternal life for granted. <laughs> I, I, what I'm trying to say is, is that I think in the church, and I'm not speaking for each of you here. I can only speak for what I've experienced myself in the past. I think we take for granted eternal life. I, I think that we it's hard for us to wrap our mind around eternal life. It's hard for us to wrap our mind around when he turns the page, what that's going to look like. Because we're physical creatures. Amen. We're terrestrial beings living on the, on the earth. And we have senses, we, we see, we taste, we smell, we hear, we touch, right? And so it's hard for us to disconnect from that. Jesus constantly warns us to disconnect from that, does he not? He, he, he yeah, talks about it. that. But, but, but yet it's difficult. And yet at the same time, there's a part to us when we hear his word, we want to do what he's asking us to do. We know that, right? And and I and I think that, that that's what, you know, what he's, he's trying to... To speak to us this morning, let me just let me go into some of these words here, and I'm just going to go ahead and you, we don't have to try to turn to them. But in Mark chapter seven thirteen, I'm just going to read quickly some of these words because I'm trying to get a I'm trying to get a hold of what the living word is saying in His written word. Okay, thus making void the word of God by your tradition that you have handed down, and many such things you do. Sometimes we allow the traditions of our life or our perceptions about what the Word of God is saying. Traditions of the church, tradition of the modern church that have filtered down. The Pharisees did it, but we also do it. And now we're, we're not taking the Word of God at face value for what it says. John 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God and the Word was God. And then the Word became flesh. The living word became flesh and dwelt with us. And that word dwelt literally means to tabernacle, to, to tent. He became, he tented himself in human flesh and his presence was with us. The, the living word of God is with us. Amen. Praise Amen. God. And John chapter 5 verse 24 says this. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. <clears throat> eternal life is a big thing, my friend. You know, I, I've shared this little this vision that the Lord gave me a while back with the church a few times, but and it's kind of a it's kind of like I don't know if it well I don't want to say it's weird. The Lord gave it to me, <laughs> but it's different, and it's at least PG thirteen. So I was right here worshiping the Lord, and all of a sudden I said, Lord, um. I remember what I said. I remember what he said. I said, I said, thank you 
I was just thanking him. And I said, I said, thank you for new life. I said, I said, thank you for saving me. Something of that nature. And then all of a sudden, I got a vision of a bunch of sperm. You know the word in the Greek, I'm just like just so you understand, the word in the Greek for seed is sperma. Alright, anyway. And I saw a bunch of sperm and they were swimming towards an egg. And then all of a sudden, at the last minute, they split off. Half of them went to the right, half of them went to the left. One sperm entered the egg, and it was obvious what it was doing. It was fertilizing the egg. And, and, and the, Lord, the Lord said, you have been given new life, and you're going to receive a promotion. And listen, this is what I want, I want, I want you to understand. It, what he was speaking to me at that moment was this. The promotion was eternal life. And he wanted me to share that with his people, that, to, that we would understand that those that are truly in Christ, that endure until the end, there is, we will receive eternal life. That there's a promotion coming on the other side of glory. And the problem, now listen, I've heard people say before, you're so heavenly minded, you're no earthly good. I'm here to tell you, sometimes we're so earthly minded, we're no heavenly good. I want to be heavenly minded to understand the Lord, and I want the Lord to work in me and through me, amen, upon the earth. I'm here to tell you, though, this, is that we need to get a hold of this Jesus that wants to change us on this side, and we got to understand that what we do today will affect our tomorrow. Leonard Ravenhill said it, and I know y'all hear me say it all the time, this life is nothing more than a dress rehearsal for eternity. And one time the Lord put it in my heart that this life on this side is its basically a job interview. That, that's the parable of the talents. That's thats whenever he's coming back to do business with his servants. How did you live your life today? That's what I'm trying to say. We treat the word of God like it's common. We treat the blood of God, Christ, like it's common sometimes. We treat eternal life, the price that he paid to give us eternal life like it's common, like it's it's not going to be that big of a deal. Like we're just going to knuckle bump and be like, all right, Lord, you got me in. Hallelujah. It's not going to be like that. He's holy. He's holy. He's worthy. His eyes, eyes burn like fire. His feet are burning like brass. Hallelujah. His hair is white like wool. He's holy. And he's going to judge. And thank God if he's not judging you for your sin, but he's going to judge you at the judgment seat of Christ. Do you get that? Am I preaching the truth? He, do you understand that there's something called the Bema seat of the judgment seat of Christ? And then he's going to judge. And some people's works are going to be wood, hay, and stubble. And they're going to be burnt up because their motives weren't right. They weren't truly living for the Lord. They really did things to be seen by man. So they call the spirit of religion. And the problem with the spirit of religion is you don't know it when you have it. Kind of like the Pharisees with a phylactery over their eyes. Physically, they couldn't see because they thought that this thing made them look religious. If you don't know what that is, a box that held scripture. And the bigger it was, the more holy they were. And they couldn't see. And, and that's the same thing with the spirit of religion. You think you're okay, but the reality of it is that that spirit blinds. And we do things to be seen by men. And we want to be validated. We want our ministry to be validated. And I'm like, Lord, get me to the place where I'm asking your spirit to be poured out. Not that Matt Amen would be validated. Not that this church would be validated. But that Jesus would be validated. That he would receive his glory and his honor because he's worthy. Praise God. And we come in here and if we would have unity. And that's part of the problem. What happened? Listen, this is, none of this is in my message, but it is. Let me ask you a question. Because we're talking about his body. We're talking about the fact that the enemy wants to dismember his body. He wants, well, uh, he wants to pull us apart one piece at a time. One fingernail, one, oh, he's brutal. He's brutal. He ain't, he's not, look, he talk about no shame in the game. He's brutal. The enemy wants to pull us apart and he wants to make it painful. Yes. What happened on the book, in the book of Acts on the day of Pentecost? What was it about the believers? One God. Unity. One mind, one accord. And the Holy Spirit showed up. And I can tell you something. I've seen situations, listen to me, I'm going to say this. I've seen situations where people operate in gifts of the Spirit, and the end result of what they're doing is not resulting in unity. I've seen it, I've seen it many a times. 
It's not resulting in unity. It's resulting in division because whether people realize it or not, they're trying to draw attention to themselves. And I'm here to tell you, if you're trying to draw attention to yourself, that is not of the Holy Ghost. The Holy Spirit says, no, glorify him, magnify him. Praise God. They're not your gifts to begin with. They're the gifts of the Holy Spirit. If he so chooses to use you as a vessel, what a privilege. Yes. Yeah. What a privilege to be utilized to give a word uh, of tongues and interpretation, a prophetic word of prophecy, to lay hands on the sick and to watch them be healed. What a privilege to be called by God to be able to preach the eternal gospel of Jesus Christ. I've been so transparent lately. There were times when I first started this chair, I look at that exit sign. I'm just going to be real with you. I look at that exit sign, and I'm like, man, this, I don't even know what this is like, small potatoes, man. I thought the Lord was going to, is it okay if I say this? Then y'all, y'all, if y'all got some spaghetti, y'all can throw it down. Great. <laughs> Sometimes I feel like that's what happens. I try to be transparent and share my heart with people, and hopefully it'll help them. They're like, man, look at this dude. I knew he was jacked up. Hello, newsflash. The pastor man ain't the only one that got wrong stuff in his heart that's festering up in there. And you know it's in there because the Lord done showed it to you, but you're not willing to reveal it and get it out. You Don't go. Don't. Cross the spiritual Jordan with that stuff up in your heart. You don't have to stand up here on this stage behind this pulpit and to do what I just did. You don't have to do that, but you better get it right with the Lord, my friend. Praise God. You don't want to stand. No, but what about his love? What about his blood? God commended his love for us, and now while we were yet sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. You think the Father's playing games here? He poured his wrath upon his son, my friend. That's a big deal. The beloved, his beloved, who never did him wrong, who never said the wrong thing, who never treated anybody wrong. Jesus, the lover of your soul. He, he laid his life down. Amen. We need to, Lord, do a work in her heart. Amen. And have a way. And I, I was thinking, you know, it's like small potatoes. And, and man, I'll tell you, when my heart somewhere in ministry, something went wrong. You know, it still felt like I was preaching the truth, but not anyway now I just say <laughs> it's not important what I do but I'm just saying what I'm, this is my prayer break me Lord break me thank you thank you for saving how many times do we remember just the, how thankful are we no come on so I need to stir you up I need to provoke you how thankful are you that he saved you? Right, do you remember it? Do you do you thank it? I know you some of you do. I know some of you do. But listen, maybe you haven't done it in a while. You need to wake up, my friend, and you need to thank him and have a heart of gratitude. Thank Quit you, all Jesus. the belly aching and complaining about all the things that are going wrong. Put your turn, come on, turn your eyes upon <laughs> Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face and the things of life will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. All the musicians and the singers close their eyes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. Turn our eyes. Praise God. Let us be thankful. And then, and then he just brought it to one other thing. I'm like, Lord, thank you for calling me to preach your gospel. What a privilege. And I just get to witness the one, just tell two people about the love of God. If one soul be plucked out of the grip of Satan's claws, oh, thank you, Lord, for the privilege. Thank you for the privilege to clean the church. Thank you for the privilege to teach the kids. Thank you for the privilege to sing for Jesus. Yes. What, what a blessing to have a gift of music and a voice that can sing for Jesus. And we, oh, Lord, help your musicians and your singers. I'm not necessarily talking about our, ours, but let me tell you, singers and musicians for Jesus, people need to, no, it ain't about us. It's not about the preacher. It's not about the singer. Let it be about Jesus. Yeah. Let him receive his glory and his honor. Let it be a privilege that we would sing to him. That we even got a voice that can sing. It doesn't matter what it sounds like, that we can exalt him. Yes. Praise God. We get so caught up, man, in all this ridiculousness. Lord, help us. 
Help us all. The Word. <clears throat> Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. John 8, 31, he said this, the truth. So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed him, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples. And then he said this in John 15, right? Because in John 15, we hear about abiding in the vine, right? I'm not going to read all of these to you. But look, he says, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. The words there is rhema, the living word of God, the, the, the right now word of God. It's a lot. Jesus is the rhema. Jesus is the living word of God, but he's also the logos word of God. He is the written word of God. And, we, and if we're going to have Jesus, if we're going to be nourished by his flesh. And we're going to be nourished by his blood. Because he says it later. I'm not going to go to it right now. But he said, the flesh profits nothing. It's the no. words that I speak to you. Yeah. And the words yeah. there is rhema. It's the rhema that I speak to you. They are spirit and, yeah. and they are life. Yeah. And in order to be nourished by this Jesus that gives us this new life. I'm telling you, I believe it's in his word. He, he wants us to be able to see some things. Because see, if we could begin to see him in the scripture and the Holy Spirit would begin to show us where we're not like him. And then we would be willing to humble ourselves yeah. and repent yeah. when we see where we're not like him. Come on. Where we've caused division yeah. in the body of Christ. Where we've tried to dismember his beautiful bride. Could you imagine the, the Lord having to find She's not going to look like that when he finds her. But you imagine, like, you know, some of these weird gothic dolls are all stitched up and they got X's on their eyes because, because the body of Christ is over here dismembering each other and pulling each other apart, causing division in the body of Christ, gossip and malice and slander behind the brothers and sisters' backs, it, it, you know, in the Lord. That's, that's horrible. The scripture teaches against it. And Lord, forgive me if I've ever done it. But the Lord, forgive you. I, for, I forgive you. I forgive you if you've done it to me. And I hope that you would forgive me if I've done it to you. Amen. 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 Praise God. Amen. And I know that we've all done it. Yes. Because for some reason we get joy out of that kind of thing. And, and even if you're not bound by it now, you've been bound by it before Amen. by the spirit of gossip. Amen. Come on, somebody. Help me out here. I'm preaching the truth. I mean, I understand some things make your flesh feel good. But why? I can remember times when I had a problem with gossip and I literally liked the way it made my flesh feel. It was like something. Anyway. All right. Let's keep going. Thank you, Lord. The prevalent idea of the chapter is food. Something to eat. He's offering true food, which when eaten will reveal who he truly is. He said, you're not seeking me because you saw the miracles. And so we must figure out what is he saying here? How often do we imagine that we are eating his words, but not perceiving what he's really saying and wanting to communicate to us? He said, don't work for the food that perishes, but for the food that he endures to eternal life. The Son of Man will give to you. And then they said, what must we do to, to be doing the works of God? Isn't that something? Well, we want to know what I need to do. He said, this is the work of God, to believe on him whom he has sent. Now, I want to talk to you just a little bit about believing. You know, and I've used this scripture a little bit lately, but the James said, you believe there's one God, you do well. The devils also believe, yet they tremble. Same word in the Greek. Now, you and I both know that devils can't believe unto salvation. There's no salvation for a demon spirit. Jesus, there's no salvation for fallen angels. Jesus descended and to save the seed of Abraham. That's what Hebrews <coughs> says. So, so what does it mean to believe? Well, listen, there's a version of this, this, this definition, and I found this in my Strong's. It says this. It's used in the New Testament of the conviction and trust to which a man, this is a lot of words, but just bear with me. Convic the, the conviction and trust to which a man is impelled. I want you to hear that word impelled. By a certain inner and higher prerogative. That's a big word for like decision making. And law of the soul. Now, I don't really have time to teach the soul versus the spirit this morning, but a lot of you have heard me teach a lot about that. While your soul and your spirit are one in the essence that they make up your inner man, they're not exactly the same. In your spirit, you're saved. That's why your soul, that's why your mind has to be renewed. 
in Christ, you've been given the mind of Christ, but most of the time we don't operate in the mind of Christ. We're still operating in our own soulish realm. What is your soul? I was sharing that with, with Trey the other day, and I mean, most of y'all already know this, but the word for soul in the Greek is suke. And they don't have a Y, and so then we put it into you, but that's where we get the word psyche. And so what I need you to understand is that the soul is made up of the mind, the will, and the emotions. Your mind is what you think. Your will is what you want. Your emotions is what you feel. And most of the time we're driven by what we think, what we want, and what we feel. Instead of what the word of the living God says. Because he's saying that we're to die, amen, and to gain, and our mind would be renewed. And the way our mind is going to be renewed is that when we come under the, we come under the authority of the living word of God. The word of God is the rule of authority for those that live in his kingdom. Those that have been converted and have been translated from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son. It's not what the, the United States government says. No, listen to me, my friend. Rome said, you will bring a sacrifice to the emperor. And true converts said, no, we won't. And so Nero covered them in pitch and set them on fire to illuminate the streets at night. No, it's not, the, it's not the government that tells us what's right from wrong, wrong, what's righteousness. And there's this whole big old movement all over the face of the earth that's trying to tell us certain things are right. When in the reality, it's against the word of God. And it's not just them things. It's just full. It's, every, it's everything that contradicts the word. That word impelled, though. I'm not much of a mechanic, but I know there's got to be a difference between an impeller and a propeller. And I do know this, that an impeller is usually something that's internal, that's pushing fluids of some sort. And what he's saying is, is that when you truly get converted, the Holy Spirit moves into your heart and it kind of becomes like, almost like a mechanical impeller. Amen. And it's moving stuff around and it's higher than your own mind, your own Amen. will, your own emotions. It's coming from your spirit. It's the spirit of the living God. And he's trying to impel you to make decisions that are holy, that are righteous that are the living word of God that are going to transform your life and make you look more like Jesus. Amen. Amen. Praise God. That's what it means to believe. Yes. When you believe unto salvation, listen to me, church. If you're saved this morning, the scripture teaches that when you believed in Christ and his sacrifice, when you truly did that, this is how you know you're saved. The Holy Spirit moved into your heart. And for young people that are old enough to understand, I don't know how many we have, not, maybe not that many, that means, that means that you listen to your parents. Yes. I'm just being real. I'm not trying to pick on you. But if it works for you, then listen. You listen to your parents. Yes. You, you submit. Yes. To, to, you obey your parents. Now, not if they're trying to tell you not to live for Jesus. Right. Now, at the same time, how do you handle that? That's between you and the Holy Ghost. Let him impel you. <laughs> yes. Amen. Let him impel you. But that's that's what that's what's happening is that when you truly got saved and you believe in the faith, the Holy Spirit moved inside of you, and now his presence is then in there impelling you to move you in the right direction. But if you know, if we don't know nothing about this book right here, we don't know nothing about Jesus. I'm here to tell you right now that this book right here and the words in this book right here, I'm going to tell you right now, it's, it, it will cut you to the core. Come on, somebody, help me out here. Yep. It will show you yourself and it will show you Jesus. But many times what we do is we're just kind of like reading it. And I've been guilty of that before. Y'all hear what I'm trying to say? The words of our Lord, many times we may not always understand them, but they're trying to really perform a, a surgical procedure on us. And that's why I kind of wanted to share a little bit of that with you. And then listen, you know, I don't want to keep you here all morning, but let me just say this, that Jesus said in Matthew chapter six, and I'm just going to kind of quickly go through some of this, but in Matthew chapter six, because see, it's his words. And, and what I'm trying to say is, is that if his words are spirit and they are life and his words are what's going to nourish me and help me to look more like him, then I have to understand his heart. And because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And so if Jesus is speaking these words that this is what's in his heart. And if I can allow these words to speak to me, then it's going to, it's going to minister. Amen. It's going to change me as, the, as I ask the Holy Spirit to use the words of Jesus to change me in the whole chapter of Matthew six. There's just so much here, but 
eight, and look at verse one. He says, "Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them." Wow. There's a lot that could be said about that. Because see, there's something in the human heart that wants to be recognized. Even when you think you don't, there's something in the human heart that wants to be recognized. We're motivated by being seen. We want you to give me, a, give us an attaboy. We want you to, and the question is, if you never get an attaboy, if you never get a pat on the back, if you never, if you're never even recognized, will that offend you? If you if you never feel like you're recognized, will that offend you and cause you like you know? If you're doing it for Jesus, are we doing it for Jesus? Amen. I believe in giving honor where honor is due. Amen. But anyway, you get the point. He said, he said, beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them, for then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. Are you seeking your reward on earth? That's when you give to the needy, don't sound a trumpet. He said, don't let your right hand know what your left hand is doing. Sometimes we do that. Oh, I gave this little offering. Like, you know, and I'm not saying there's never a time to do that. But you when you give to the needy, don't let your right hand know what your left hand is doing. So that your giving would be insane. Hey, when you pray, he didn't say if you pray, right? I know Brother Borg. When, when you pray, do you believe in prayer, my friend? Yep. I want you to know something. I've spent a lot of my Christian walk without without a real much of a life of prayer. And I'm, and I'm ashamed to tell you that. Don't do that. Be, be a woman and a man of prayer. Even if you start off with just a little bit. Go to the Lord. And, and listen. Let, let us not go to the Lord with everything that we think we need to get from Him. Let us find out from His heart what He's asking of us. Come on. Praise God. Oh, I'm telling you. Yeah, even if you're just blessed with a more intimate relationship with Jesus, that's what you're looking for. And he said that. He said, um, he said, when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners that they may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. He said, when you fast, do not look gloomy like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces that their fasting may be seen by others. Isn't that something? Don't you, you know, it's like... <sighs> Preach it. Yeah. But sometimes we just want everybody to know what we're going through. And don't get me wrong, there's a place and a time for everything. Amen. Go to your brother, go to your sister. You need prayer, man, there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah. <clears throat> Lord help us. Amen. 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 That's just that's just a little bit of it. Look at look at Matthew chapter, well, this is Matthew chapter 16, verses 24. Matthew 16, verse 24 through 26. Jesus told his disciples, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Forever, whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man give in return for his soul? Wow. How, how, do, we, how do we take the words of our Lord when we understand that our God is a God that blesses people. Anybody in here been blessed by the Lord? Yeah. Amen. Sometimes, if we're not careful, though, we might be being blessed by the enemy and we're thinking it's the Lord. That is a possibility. But, but I'm just trying to say, we most of us have experienced the blessing of the Lord. You know, your your term of blessing might be different than mine. When I went to Mexico, I, I slept in this guy's house on the mountainside. First time I ever did that with Gaudi. And his walls were made of bamboo. But guess what? He had just added on a prophet's room. Wow. He had just added on a prophet's room for whenever he had, he had ministers of the gospel that were coming. That he could house them in his house. He had, a, he, he had a job where he had his own truck that he delivered groceries. And when it comes to houses that are made with bamboo walls on the side of this mountain, he wasn't doing so bad. The Lord was expanding his tent stakes even plus there you are. But then you and I would scoff at that. He had a table full of food. Just a little bit of rain coming in through the tent. It wasn't that bad. I was able to see some of the stars through the bamboo on the wall. Praise God. I slept better that night than I did in the air conditioned room at the other people's house. Praise God. Praise God.
the heart of our Lord and the words that he's speaking to us. You know, he brought his disciples to Caesarea Philippi <laughs> according to uh, according to, to some scholars, the place where he brought them was at the foot of the mountain of the God Pan. And that was whenever Jesus said, you know, who do men say that I am? And then Peter finally says, you are, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus says to him, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, Peter, but my Father in heaven. And upon this rock, this truth, I believe is what he's saying there. This yes. truth. Yes. I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And so at the mouth of Pan, at the bottom of this mountain, they called it the gates of hell. And so Jesus is saying, he's making a claim. Here. He's, he's staking a claim. I wish that we really had more time to even talk about that. The fact that God is staking a claim. He's taking this earth back and he's living for people like you that will be converted, that will allow the Holy Spirit to have his way and will intercede and to believe God and will tell others about the good news of Jesus. Because listen to me, that has to do with your reward. And if we're not doing that on this side and we're just living for our own prosperity and we're willing to forfeit our own soul for because we're laying up treasures on earth instead of treasures in heaven. He said that in Matthew 6. Lay not up for yourself treasures on earth where moth and rust corrupt. But lay up for yourself treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not corrupt. Amen? Amen. And, and, and so Jesus said, upon this rock I will build my church. And then the next thing you know, Peter's like, it says Jesus begins to tell them that the Son of Man is going to have to go to Jerusalem and he's going to suffer many things. And what does Peter do? Peter says, not so, Lord. I rebuke that. I'm paraphrasing. Yeah. And what does Jesus say? He says, get behind me, Satan. Get behind me, Satan, for you savor not or you have not the things of God in your heart, but instead the things of man. Mm. You savor the things of man. And if we do a little bit of research of the context of what was going on in Rome at the time, we understand that the Jewish people were subservient to the Roman Empire and they remembered all the Old Testament scriptures that said their Messiah, their king was going to come and deliver them and that and, and that all of the nations were going to come and pay homage to the Messiah and Peter sees him as the Messiah and he's like, not so Lord, we got nations to rule. Not so Lord, they got nations that need to come pay their homage to you. And, and he trying basically and what Jesus recognizes in him is that's that same thing that we saw in the garden that took place yeah. that's that same thing right there that the enemy the serpent deceived Eve I'm concerned that just as the serpent deceived Eve that you may be led astray from your simple and pure devotion to Christ Jesus and, and, and just the same way the enemy injected that inside of Adam he tried to inject it in Jesus. Wow. It, when he brought, Luke chapter 4 says that the enemy took Jesus upon a mountain and showed him the kingdoms of the earth. And he says, bow before me and worship me and I will give you these kingdoms. And, 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 and he said, this is what he said, because they've been delivered to me. Yeah. Mm. They've been delivered to me and I give them to whom I will. See, there's something inside of man. He's looking to build his own kingdom. And whenever he's confronted by the gospel, even as believers, listen to me, I'm telling you the truth this morning. When we're confronted by the gospel, even as believers, sometimes we don't like the way that feels. Amen. And I'm here to tell you, Jesus is not interested in one moment for us building our own kingdom. He will not share his glory with another. And the quicker we learn to die to ourselves and exalt Jesus in our life, I'm telling you, all those other things shall be added unto you. But we don't get them added unto us because that's why we're serving him. And how do you get that in our head, Lord? Right? Because in the back of our mind, we're thinking, yeah, right, he's going to hear he's going to Y'all know what I'm talking about. Or like, pray for those that despitefully use you. The Lord will heap hot coals on their head. And it's like, I know he doesn't want me praying that way so that he will heap hot coals. How do I get my heart right, Lord? Mm. Praise God, help us. Yes. He said, not so, Lord, this isn't. This isn't for you. We got rain in here. Peter, I would hear the Lord say, Peter, you don't understand yet, but you will. Aren't you, aren't you thankful that the Lord has grace and mercy with us? Yes. Matt, you don't understand yet, but you will. Yes. Amen. One day you're going to understand it real good when you see me. Amen. But I don't know about you, but I want to get some of that understanding now. Yes. Amen. <laughs> Peter, you don't understand yet, but you will. In order for those to inherit the eternal kingdom you're talking about over there, 
or to rule and reign with him over there, there must be a dying to this temporary world here. Mm -hmm. Oh, I don't think that. I, I know y'all getting tired. It's, a, it's been a long day already. Let me, let me just say this. You singers, musicians, we're just going to go ahead and close. If y'all can come forward. Okay. It says this. I, I wrote this down. I feel like this is the heart of the Lord. No, Peter, you don't understand yet, but you will. In order for those to inherit the eternal kingdom you're talking about there, or to rule and reign with him there, there must be a dying to this temporary world here. I don't know what that means for my sister Jess. I don't know what that means for you, Josh, or you, Mary, or you, Trey. I don't know what that means for you, Jerry. No. I don't know what that means for you, Dad. For you personally. Wow. Aaron, I'm starting to get a glimmer of what it might mean for me. Yeah. And as I seek him more, I want him to show me that. What does it mean that if I'm going to truly rule and reign with you there? No, the scripture says that if you're in Christ, yeah. he says that he's made us to be kings and priests unto our God. He ransomed us. That he's worthy to open the seal because he ransomed us with his blood from every tongue and tribe and nation. God's got a plan on this earth, my friend. We're going to be getting into that probably starting in a couple of weeks about the seven-headed beast of Revelation 17. I'm here to tell you it's all about the nations, the tribes, and the tongues. Jesus has come to redeem them, and God is looking for a people, amen, that are good. He's going, he is redeeming people from every tongue and tribe and nation. He is taking back what belongs to him. He started, hallelujah, with a word to a man named Abraham. And through that nation, amen, he gave the world to Christ. The seed that would bless every tongue and tribe and nation. Abraham, our father of the faith. The father of multiple nations. Why? Because those that are of the seed of Abraham, the children of Abraham are children of faith. Amen. Amen. Are you a child of faith this morning? Yes. Amen. If you're not a child of faith, if you're not sure, you can be one today. Mm. Praise God, as y'all begin to sing and y'all begin to play, I just want you to know if you need prayer this morning for something, amen. If you've never given your heart to Jesus, you can call on his name. Amen. He won't leave you. He won't forsake you. If you call on his name, 